Hi, and welcome to the Law Center videocast. I'm the host and founder of the Law Center, Larry DeMarco. Thanks for joining us this evening. We go live on Tuesday nights at 7, so please follow in the chat room where you can interact live with other viewers. Today, we're here with Danica Joan Dockery. She's a certified family mediator with the Florida Supreme Court, a guardian ad litem, the author of Florida's Family Stabilization Parent Education Curriculum, a personal custody coach, and founder of Kids Need Both, Inc. Joan, thanks for being a guest on the Law Center videocast. Thank you for inviting me, Larry. Tell us about kidsneedbotho.org and uh, Hope for Families. Okay, so Kids Need Both is a nonprofit and its mission is to educate those who are impacted by high conflict families. And those who are impacted are professionals uh, and families. Um, and Hope for Families is a project that we at Kids Need Both have created, and it's a collaborative uh, community platform with uh, the opportunities to, to take courses and to actually get plugged in to uh, communities. And um, in, we are working on building strategic alliances with other organizations so that we all can work together for the common goal of bringing healing to hurting families. So why are you passionate about your work and what brought you into it? Uh, that, that would take you me back to 2001. Uh, I was going through, I chose to initiate a divorce and I had five little children at the time, did not expect to be blindsided through um, by the reactions of my husband. He, um, it was kind of a burn and pillage kind of approach. It was like, let's destroy at all cost. I want this family to stay together. And I knew that it was not a healthy situation. And um, I had to go through five and a half years of a horrible custody battle and fighting off abuse allegations against me. And uh, it was just, it was just mind blowing. And, I, and, and if it weren't for having friends and loved ones around me, I don't know that I, I really could have survived that. Definitely, I could not have maintained the relationship with my children years later. So kids need both and hope for families, I imagine, is a reaction to your experiences. Let's go into a little more detail. First, tell us more about kidsneedbotho.org. Well, Kids Need Both, back in 2001, I when I was trying to find answers for my own situation, I researched the internet, and of course, the internet was a lot more rudimentary than it is now. And I just kept searching and searching for answers to my situation. That's when I discovered the term parental alienation, and it was spot on how my children were reacting uh, in the situation. And I thought to myself, if me, after going through all of this pain, I cannot be the only one. And how can I use my pain and make it something powerful and healing for another person who's going through what I'm going through? And that's when I decided to start uh, kidsneedbotho.org. And it's, you know, it's taken something. And over those years, we I decided, you know, what do I do? It was, I was sort of a lone soldier at first trying to make a difference on my own. So I first used the website to curate uh, resources from all over the globe, trying to educate people, because back then you truly had to educate the, the judges, the principals of your school, you, the mental health counselors, you had to educate them because even the profes professionals didn't know what parental alienation was. So that out creating uh, Kids Need Both started as a repository. It expanded into creating conferences, bringing professionals together in one spot. And because I knew that if I focused on educating the professionals, then I may be in contact with one mental health counselor, but by speaking education into them, it expanded their reach exponentially. 
So that's kind of where it came from, but I also knew that it was important to reach out to the individual parent who was struggling as well. And it was just really Kids Need Both was the place so that we could just keep educating the community and also making connections with other professionals. So it's a website of resources to educate on parental alienation. Yes. And it was actually right before the pandemic that my team and I were creating another conference called Guardians and Gatekeepers. And we I attended that. I, I was there. <laughs> yes. You know, it was really, it's been wonderful talking to these other advocates because the thing is, is it's through our advocacy that it brings our, us our own healing. Whether uh, the outcome ended up resulting in a reconciliation of a relationship with our children, or it didn't, it was through by giving back and pushing through our pain and being of service to people that we all find healing and unity. So doing the Guardians and Gatekeepers Conference, we got about five weeks before the conference was to happen. And then the whole nation shut down. So my team and I, they were, they were letting me know what was going on. It was almost, you know, cause I'm, I'm in Florida and we're very familiar with hurricanes coming and putting our whole community into a screeching halt. So doing with this pandemic coming and doing the same thing, we looked at what's possible. Well, I've been for several years now be, been having meetings over Zoom and, and all that. And I said, well, that's easy. We're gonna just shift it to an online uh, kind of conference. Um, so I was able to get with all of our speakers and, and work out the logistics. And we actually put guardians and gatekeepers into existence on the internet so people could participate. And the, the extra, I guess the extra bonus was it now exists and it continues to exist so that people can access guardians and gatekeepers as a course. So you, you also had another conference, wasn't it uh, maybe a month ago, Joan, maybe two months, six weeks or something like that? Um, no, I, I haven't. Oh, I know what you're talking about. So that was you, right? <laughs> I was in that. Yes. I was okay. in the conference. So what happened in the course of it, and I think, you know, what's amazing to me is a lot of people have shared that through the pandemic, they're, they're actually the things that they're up to have, have expanded. It's not contracted and shut down and, and all that. It's, a, it's actually the experience of opposite that. So in building the relationships with the different organizations and the people that were up to stuff, um, I was actually able to work with other organizations to have their conferences go into the the internet format they, they didn't abandon the live and in person like i worked with uh was an ann o'keefe rogers out of jacksonville florida and they had a retreat conference and i believe that's the one that you're speaking of yes um, that i spoke at and we were actually able to back up um you know her conference through technology and something you may not know about me is that is i'm a complete techie nerd. <laughs> my, uh, my master's is in instructional technology. So to be able to create something that lives like evergreen in a core learning uh, management system is definitely my thing. So I was able to, to help her put on her live conference. And now it exists in the LMS part of Hope for Families platform. And I was able to do that also with Mark Ludwig. I went over a year ago to, uh, to St. Louis and he was putting on a conference and it was a legislative conference because that's his, that's his um, wheelhouse. And I was able to just, just being a contribution it helps my voice and my message expand exponentially. Very good. And so tech nerd, which... 
I try to be too, which I'm very proud of, but you're also a certified mediator and a guardian ad litem. When did that come in through your professional development? I guess it's, it's me probably just wanting to have no moss under my feet and just try to do like, how can I help more and more and more? And it's been over the course of my years that I've been able to write the family stabilization course for parents, because that was really my connection to parents. I was working with professionals, and now this I could actually personally impact parents going through separation and divorce with a course that they already have to take anyway. And um, so I did that. Um, and in that process, I also discovered that I qualified educationally and experience-wise to become a, a family mediator. So of course I'm going to do that because, you know, mediation is the most harm harmonious way of working things out in the court versus the litigative way where it's, you know, it's, you know, win at all cost kind of, you know, mindset sometimes. Um, For sure. And it's certainly that better. item was another way to personally touch the lives of children. So we uh, heard a lot about uh, kidsneedbotho.org, but then it grew or it gave birth to another um, organization, hopeforchange.org. Please tell us about that. Well, hope for hope for families. It's actually hopeforfamilies.net. <laughs> uh, meant to, sorry about that, hopeforfamilies.org, of course, please. And we are hoping for change. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Hopeforfamilies.net. What I we discovered as a team at Kids Need Both is, is that how can we be of service to all of these people who are up to big and powerful things in trying to bring equality in into the realm of family advocacy and high conflict custody battles. So uh it took a while for us to probably a couple of years for us after guardians and gatekeepers to figure out, well, what does that look like that we can be of um, this collaborative force? So then we said, well, let's do a platform because that's the nerd in me and the educator in me. I've got to have like that learning management system component. And I thought, well, you know what, what if we had um, oh, and the other thing that was operating, if you recall, so it was all this drama around social media, around Facebook and Twitter and on and on and on. So I thought, well, what if we created this, this uh, safe space, this platform community that has uh, courses that people, that professionals can use for continuing education and parents can use um, to, to help them in, in different aspects of their, uh, what they're going through. Uh, we also wanted to have a place like the, where a professional's directory so that we could curate all of the professionals that we knew were up to, up to good things. And they, they are people that we endorse as these are the good guys. And then right. if we wanted a place for people, for all of these people, if they're doing events, how can we put that into a calendar? And there's so many other aspects that, uh, that we've put into this platform, like uh, news feeds and stuff like that, that we want it. It's kind of like, okay, we opened up this, this, this big playground for all the professionals to come and uh, take advantage of these, these resources. So we were like, okay, uh, we've opened up the doors and okay, so we're ready, open for business, so to speak. And then we thought, what's missing? Well, what's missing is an alliance, an alliance of the different organizations uh, who can actually be the, the elders that push uh, the expansion together. And that's when we came up with the Hope for Families Strategic Alliance of Organizations. Would you like? <laughs> yeah, go There's ahead. also a uh, some type of manual, or, or maybe not quite. Yeah, a, a pledge that they're all um, 
representing and certifying that they're they're, they're sticking to best practices mm -hmm. and the highest of ethics and the highest quality standards. You also ensure or at least require a commitment that each professional maintain the standards that you, uh, Joan, are, are living your profession through, correct? Yes, absolutely. Uh, you know, there's so many people, and I'm sure a lot of the viewers know that, you know, they've uh, may have been taken advantage of, or maybe not just taken advantage of, or maybe even um, they got connected with a professional that's clueless about what they're going through. And um, we wanted to make sure that when people come over, a lot of people who find the Hope for Families platform, they've already gone through their life savings. They've already trusted someone who's taking, who's now no longer working for them because they're out of money. And we realized that the best thing is to be self-empowered. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, you can't put your fate into anybody's hands and not stay somewhat in the driver's seat of your life. And part of that is educating yourself. You know, if you are in a swirl of emotion and panic and anxiety and stuff like that, first thing is you've got to, you know, put that mask on yourself and the, you know, it, it, you've got to put that oxygen mask on, it grounds you, it calms you down. You've got to be calm. And if you can't do that, then we have, we have coaches on the platform um, or, you know, courses and things like that so that you can and a community. Um, it sort of lost my thought, but it is well, you're, you're going on the resources. Yes. Self-empowerment. Self <laughs> it's what I found, and this is what I work with when I work with my clients, is it, there are times when you definitely need a legal professional to do the legal work, but understand that their wheelhouse is with the legal aspect of it, and you cannot possibly expect them to also be your, your sounding board, your, your therapist, and, and everything like that. You have to almost take a two-pronged or a multi-pronged approach to your case. You've got to thrive in your own life financially, but also work on the relationship. If you have any access to your children, work on that relationship in a healthy way. Um, while you allow that legal professional to do what they do best. So counterintuitive or self-destructive or destructive anyway, to think, to go through a breakup of the family and what the court system requires you to do is fight, is to litigate, is to take an adversarial system when you're actually, you're separating, but you're still a family unit, especially when you have, well, when you have children. If you don't have children, we're really not, it, it's not the, the, that same uh, need. But so the other resources that you're talking about, is that what the Florida Family Stabilization Parent Education Curriculum is? The that is that's a four hour course. It's mandated by the legislature. The legislature create tell, told me what I needed to have in the course in order for it to pass in the courts. So every okay. parent and that's both uh, the husband and the wife have to take their own uh, four hour course and turn in the re in the certificate uh, for their case in order to uh, to complete their case, whether it's a separation or a divorce with, with minor children, they have to take this four hour course. And, you know, when you think about it, a lot of times parents are like, it's a, just a checklist item and they get confused. They think that, oh, it's a parenting course. And they're saying, wait a minute, I know how to be a parent, but you may know how to be a parent, but do you know how to be a co-parent? Do you know how to be that partner, you know, in, in raising those children when you no longer have a relationship with each other. And in that course, we try to share with people the importance of you know, being there for your child also means that you've got to shield them from any animosity you have with the other parent. And you can't be playing tactics and bringing the children in. I mean, it, you know, 
20 some years ago when I was going through it, even now my children are adults and I have really good relationships with each, each one of them. But even now they, uh, I help them to work through some of the trauma that they experienced back then. Um, and so it is, it's important that we somehow pre prevent, educate ourselves so that we don't unknowingly cause additional trauma to our children. And that's pretty much what the course is all about. So this course, which is the four hour curriculum, what other support is there that you offer as kids need both and even larger, more largely uh, the um, hope for families? Well, probably one of the most direct uh, forms of help is we have our hope line. So I have a body of coaches that I've trained personally to, to, to answer people's calls. And it's not a, an earth, it's not at this point set up to be a, an impromptu crisis line call. It is something where you have to schedule a time with a coach for no charge so that you can be connected and to them and they can share with you the resources that are available and also coach you through what it is that you're going through. A lot of people do not realize the value of coaches. And, and I guess, and in fact, in the industry, the coaching industry, it's almost like a big joke of, you know, of anybody could be a coach, but in the realm of the Hope for Families coaches, my vision is to also bring in family mediators, certified family mediators, and teach them uh, and help them to join our coaching body. And the reason for that is that family mediators are very underutilized. They, um, there's, it's starting to get in the courts the importance of mediation, but typically when you go through a divorce and they require you to go to mediation before you get your final judgment, People just think it's a checklist item. They don't realize the value of being able to determine the outcome of your family so that your the judge does not have to make the decision for you. Sure. I think the lawyers have a lot to do with that. In an adversarial system, lawyers feel that it's their job to help you, quote unquote, win. But if one parent wins in the traditional a definition of a legal battle, then really both parties and the family ends up losing, don't you think? Absolutely. And I've seen it because I've I've mediated different situations where where I have had a party represented by an attorney. So the attorney comes in to the mediation as well. Um, and I've had it where where the parties have been pro se. And you know, I have no other agenda. Like I'm so as a mediator, you're so neutral and with being having a heart for children, if I have any bias, it's what's for the best interest of those children. And when I conduct a mediation with a pro se litigants, it was it's actually uh, works out so much better. Where people, I can you know, getting people on the same same page. Whereas when one or both is represented by a lawyer. The lawyer is in their ear, giving them doubt, you know, always, you know, finding a way that their, their client is giving up something. Sure. I'm sure it's, it's typical that you've uh, reached a resolution between two parties and then they go talk to the lawyers and then it falls apart at the legal stage. I'm sure you've had that experience. Definitely. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. So how can we utilize these amazing certified family mediators, but to put them, they've, they're already trained to communicate with people who are adversarial and, um, and they know something about the law, even if like I'm an educator mediator, uh, they have mental health counselors who are eligible to be mediators. And then there's legal professionals that are eligible to be mediators. And even though I'm not a lawyer mediator, I do have um, the foundations for how re relationships for, should, would work. In fact, I would assert that as an educator and that I have those qualities, those communication qualities um, that maybe a lawyer mediator do does not have. 
Sure. It's part of that training. But one thing that I would advise families who are involved in the litigation system is if you get a lawyer to help you resolve your situation with your ex, make sure you go to a lawyer who is what I would call mediation friendly. And I'm sure you have uh, a few lawyer friends on speed dial that you say, hey, if you get a lawyer, use this one. He understands the need to get it done without fighting and yes. that the value of an agreement. They exist. <laughs> it does. And, and the thing is, it goes back to take control of your case, be self-educated, self-empowered, because the thing is, is people will call our, our hope line and they'll ask for uh, who, where's an attorney? And I'll say, wait a minute, wait a minute. First of all, we got to find out where your case is, what jurisdiction is your, does your case reside? And do I even know a lawyer that I would recommend in that jurisdiction? And I'm in it, that can be very hard, but I've, I have coached people who are going through custody battles and I, and I did not have access to legal professionals in that jurisdiction, but coaching them, I was constantly saying, okay, what's going on? I'm, you know, I'm the, uh, I'm the one that's kind of overlooking the situation from above, from a bird's eye perspective. And I'm saying, okay, what's your attorney doing? You know, what, what is, um, I can ask them what so in their case and, and ask them the questions that they need to know. I have, I am so sold on coaching, um, pa parents who are going through this in every case, like every case that I have coached on, um, has resulted in shorter time to, uh, of resolution. My client got more than they thought they would get. I mean, literally, they thought if I could only have supervised visitation because I found I got I got arrested because um, you know of a circumstance. So all I want is just to have access to my child. And I'm like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Actually, across the nation, the the wave that's coming is. 50-50 equal shared parenting is hitting all the states. So I'm saying just because you're you're the father does not mean that you have less rights than the mother. And when they start thinking about it, they start grounding themselves, they start getting out of their fear and uh, and realizing, wait a minute, you know, I there's not, you know, it's it's really taking the fear out of the space. So what do you think needs to change about the family court system? You're pro shared parenting, right? Yes, yes. Very pro. And, and it's really kind of, oh, goodness, what should change? Um, <laughs> that there that should always, I mean, this is part of the 50-50 equal shared parenting. Um, parents should start out, whether they've been married or not married, they should start out having equal, you know, equality, 50-50. They both took part in the creation of this child. And, um, and it's really kind of sad because this is how a mom has the advantage. And this is how a dad has the advantage in going through a high conflict situation. If you've never been married to dad, mom automatically starts with 100%. And dad has to fight for his 50% and more than likely he gets less than that. Now in the, in another situation, if the parents were married, then dad has the advantage because, um, and especially in my situation, we were married, dad had the advantage because he made the accusations that put the shadow of doubt in the court that I was, you know, a good mom. So then I had to work work towards regaining my 50-50. So, and it shouldn't be that way. In fact, if it was not an adversarial situation, if the courts would take a stand that, all right, we're going to presume 50-50 and you have to prove, prove without a doubt, 
why it shouldn't be 50-50. Or the other one parent says, listen, you know what? It doesn't work in my situation for me to exercise my 50%. So instead of you taking it from me, I'm going to give it to you. Then it becomes more of a workability kind of situation. And just to flush through what you were talking about, you made a comment, the, the woman always has the advantage when they're not married. And I think the biggest reason there is because the woman has possession. <laughs> she, the, the possession starts, that advantage is, all right, well, if you're in possession and he's out of possession, then he's going to be a visitor or he's going to get a limited amount of time and not take out from a stable home. And then during the marriage, you said the man has an advantage. You qualified that by because he makes usually the man will make a false allegation. So I, I would like to just put a more gender uh, non-specific specificity there. A false allegation, unfortunately, can be used as a silver bullet really by either parent. And in, in your situation, um, you know, it was made by the man. But unfortunately, uh, I think that courts need to have penalties for when people make false allegations. And right now it's not even enforced when that happens. Yeah, they're not. The judges are, they are trying to make a determination that does not put the child in, in harm's way. Uh, so a lot of times, so that they don't have to make a decision, they just keep pushing, just put, kicking the can down the road, hoping that, that, they'll find resolution amongst themselves. And in fact, if the, you know, if the parents don't go back to court, they just stopped going because they ran out of money or whatever, or one just gave up, um, then the court system says, ah, I guess we solved that problem. Uh, unfortunately, um, Danica, we're out of time, but I want you to tell, this will be in the description portion of the video, but I would like you to share how people can get in touch with you verbally so they can hear it as well. Okay, so if you, the best way and the easiest way to remember is if you go to kidsneedbotho.org, uh, that is the best place I have a way that you can, can reach out and contact us on that page. But we also in the top right hand, corner, there's a link to join our community. And that's the hopeforfamilies.net community. Uh, we have a, a newsletter that goes out every week that shares what's happening in the community and with our strategic partners and, and all that. That's probably, and also at hopeforfamilies.net, there's an opportunity to schedule a coaching call. Uh, if you want to reach out to one of our coaches or, you know, you can always, if you send me a message, and, and say this, I want to reach out to you, Danica, then I'll get the message too. Well, Danica, let's leave it there. And I want to thank you for being a guest on the Law Center videocast. Thank you for having me. We've been here with Danica Joan Dockery, and I am your host, Larry DeMarco. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to like, comment, share, subscribe, click the notification bell to be alerted of new Law Center videos. Tune in every Tuesday night at seven where you can watch with other viewers uh, on the right side of the screen. Check the description portion of this video where you can learn more, learn more about uh, Danica and the Law Center. Signing off, tune in next time. Bye for now.